You're listening to the Light Novel Podcast. Visit us online at lightnovelpodcast.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Light Novel Podcast. I am Justice Arstone, and with me tonight, I have Jean-Luc. Hi there. I have Kyle. Hola. And I've got flies. Boon dog. And flies just kind of cut out, and all I got was bunk. What's up? I, I, there we go. Okay. Um, so tonight, so tonight, our main focus is going to be on the series. Is it wrong to try to pick up girls in a dungeon? The very unfortunately titled series that uh, is so much better than its title suggests. Uh, although it is short form known as Don Machi, which I'm pretty sure most of us will refer to it because it's just way too much to say the English title. But before we get into that, let us first talk about some of the stuff that has come up in the news since our last broadcast. Uh, first off, Bookwalker announces the next big light novels. Uh, Bookwalker, if anyone's not familiar, is a big e-tailer of ebooks in both Japan and also in English now. Uh, and they ran, I guess, a uh, poll on their website asking people what they thought were going to be sort of these great new series, what series were popular. Uh, they limited it to any books that were released in the past year. And so they came out with their top 10. Uh, the first three are uh, Kaifuku Jutsushi no Yari Naushi. I'm not even going to bother with the rest of it. The story follows a healing magic user who realizes white magic has more abilities than simply being exploited by adventurers. While dying, the mage uses his magic to travel back in time four years to become even more powerful with his newfound knowledge. Uh, kind of a revenge type story. And uh, as I understand it, it's he's pretty vicious with his revenge. Yes, it is. Okay, so JL knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, I heard it's pretty dark. Uh, second one is Combatants Will Be Dispatched. Uh, this one actually notable because it's by Natsume Akatsuki, who is the author of Konosuba. Uh, this one actually sounds really entertaining. I kind of hope we get this one in English. Uh, the story follows number six, a guy reconstructed to work for the evil organization Kisaragi. Despite its reputation, members of Kisaragi are a bunch of weirdos that seem more interested in saving the world than dominating it. Number Six's latest mission is to head to an alien planet with his android partner Alice and to invade. But this new world is full of fantastical elements like unicorns and knights. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like more of the... Uh... Konosuba wackiness that we uh, all know and love, I guess. <laughs> uh, finally, I'll just do the first top three. Uh, Kimi to Boku no Saigo no Senjo. Uh, two countries are at war, the Empire and the Imperial Household Agency. Iska is a swordsman fighting for the Empire and Alice Liese is hailed as the strongest ice mage from the Imperial Household Agency. The two nemeses meet on the battlefield and sparks of a different sort begin to fly. So that's kind of the top three. I'll have a link on uh, the website, lightnovelpodcast.com, where you can go to Anime News Network and read the entire list of the top ten. Uh, I know, uh, like I said, I'm I'm very interested in getting the uh, Natsume Akatsuki one. I, I I think that'll be a good time. I'd like to read that one. Not too sure about the whole revenge, like, because I, I heard there's, like, like rape and murder and everything else in that one, but... Yeah, he's really, really hardcore on his revenge. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, maybe one to avoid if you don't like those kind of things, if it does come out in English at some point. Uh, second news piece. The Irregular at Magic High School is getting its very first spin-off novel after, like, 26 volumes. 
apparently this one it is the novel features a new heroine named Yuki Hashibami who is a magician assassin but she's not a magician herself and it is her about her challenging Tatsuya in the story and oh that boy. apparently uh yeah I know right that's gonna go so well for her I can already see it um <laughs> 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 yeah, don't challenge a DBZ character that's in the modern world. It's like, yeah, that's probably not a good no, idea. No, it never goes well when you're going to... It never goes well. Uh, so anyway, apparently this one's being serialized on the Dengeki Bunko website. And then I guess they're compiling the serialized episodes into novels and then releasing them in that format. Uh, next up, J Novel Club announced more licenses recently um yay <laughs> Ooh, yum more yeah just to keep us all really busy uh apparently i guess uh well i know just a week or so ago there was otakuthon in montreal canada which john luke, yeah, <laughs> which which john luke was lucky enough to attend um and i guess they had uh j novel was there and had a panel and announced uh so they've got Echo, which is a novelization of a Vocaloid song by Crusher P. Uh, the book is written by Akira, which is kind of notable because uh, Akira also wrote Yume Niki, which was one that J Novel Club released. Uh, it was kind of interesting, actually. I really liked the light novel Yume Niki, although apparently I'm, I'm kind of curious about this one because... I don't think Yume Niki has done very well for J Novel Club, and yet they've picked up another single volume based on a kind of outlier type thing, a Vocaloid song of all things. I don't know. I listened to the song and I was kind of like, well, it's cool, but I don't really see how somebody could write a book out of it. Uh, they also announced All Roots Lead to Doom, My Next Life as a Villainess. <laughs> Uh, which is that a one sounds good. Oh, this one actually, I'm really excited for this one actually. So it's a reincarnation in an Otome visual novel type series, and basically, I guess the main character she discovers that she's been reincarnated in sort of the villainous route, and pretty much all routes, if she follows the gameplay, lead to her destruction, and so she decides to like fully embrace the whole villain role and go all out to make her own sort of root in this and to break the game. That's kind of the gist I get, but it's much more of like a, but I, I thought it was much more of like a shoujo title. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Um, I was following the manga for it. Uh, that's been released or been translated, I should say. And, um, it's more, yeah, it is definitely more of a shoujo thing, but it's more of a, um, comedy than anything else just because, she really goes off in her own world. Um, the main character I'd almost uh, compare to uh, Spider Girl. Oh, yeah. From, uh, so I'm a spider in that she, you know, she could be uh, sarcastic. She can get distracted. She can get full of herself. And she loses track of the plot herself. So she often forgets that... <laughs> You know, she's she's not supposed to do this thing or else it'll set her on this course or she'll accidentally um, uh, steal lines from the video game that another character is supposed to say. So she ends up like taking somebody else's position in these different routes and it gets oh, really kind of hectic, <laughs> hectic and hilarious. Oh, yeah, that sounds, sounds awesome. Fun. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that one. That is pretty awesome. Cool. Uh, and then apparently it's my fault that my husband's head turned into that of a beast. <laughs> so this one's, it's only two volumes, I guess. And, uh, and yeah, I guess it's about a woman who somehow turns her husband into a beast. It's kind of a rift on the whole beauty and the beast story. If I kind of gather. Final bit of light novel news that I'll cover this week. Uh, Arrow Manga Sensei is getting a Yay. manga spin-off which is starring Elf Yamada. Uh it's apparently called Aero Manga Sensei the Great Teacher Elf Yamada's Cooked Meals of Pure Love. 
<laughs> and so the first chapter apparently features Elf cooking meals for Masamune Izumi as he trains for the light novel Tenkaichi Budokai competition, which I guess if you've read the series or seen the anime, you probably know what that means. I have done neither, so I don't know. But uh, this author is just totally shameless, isn't he? <laughs> he'll just he'll just pick up whatever fad is going on at the time and just roll with it. So well, you I... go from little sister porn <laughs> to now food porn. <laughs> at least he's giving best girl the series that she deserves. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but a, a cooking series, really? Well, I mean, you know, hey, if they could turn fate stay night into a friggin' cooking series come on i mean really it's literally the it's literally the best fate adaptation ever (laughs) no questions 10 out of 10 well i mean yeah i mean really like that just seems to be kind of the thing now if you can do a spin-off do a cooking spin-off that just it makes sense to me i guess i'm not gonna fight it whatever Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, of course, we were talking just before we started recording, we were talking that there's, of course, some news starting to come out about, uh, anime series that have been previously announced that are finally getting announced when they're going to be releasing. Uh, I know that, uh, Crunchyroll was saying, was it Crunchyroll? I believe that was saying that they're going to premiere Sword Art Online, the very first episode of the Alicization arc in September. I read that somewhere. Apparently the first episode's an hour long. So that ought to be interesting. Yeah, I saw it somewhere too, but I can't remember. And then I know that, uh, I know for a fact though, that at Crunchyroll's uh, Crunchyroll Expo, which is their con that's happening in a couple weeks, uh, they are going to be having the very first episode of The Rising of the Shield Hero showing there. That I'm looking looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, the the PVs that they've shown for it look pretty good. Actually, I I'm the animation looks decent. Like I'm I'm pretty impressed so far. I'm hopeful. I have my fingers crossed because I liked I liked the light novel series, and I would like to see it get sort of a a decent treatment anime wise. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how many books they cover in that though. Well, isn't the first isn't the first arc four volumes? Yeah, I was gonna say it is the first. Yeah, it would make sense to cover the first four of books. And I I don't think they announced how long the anime was gonna be, but if it's like a one core season, it's probably just gonna be the first four books. Yeah, to be safe. I, yeah, that would make sense because really going beyond that, yeah, it totally starts into a another arc that goes on for like another five six books. So yeah, it wouldn't make sense. Would prefer two cores with uh, like the the four first four volumes like because the first four they go to a lot of different places so like I, I'm scared that if they do only one core it will be like too chopped. Well, uh, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, well, funny enough, what a beautiful segue into Don Machi, which had five volumes covered in its single core season, and you want to talk about. Butchered and chopped. Yeah, because the the, the Ford volume is only one episode. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, I mean, admittedly, the fourth volume, like two thirds of it is one story. And then there's like two short stories to kind of pad it out. But but still, you're right. You like I mean, considering it, it introduces a very important character, you would think there would be just a little bit more effort put into that episode i'm convinced honestly that like we were talking about and we're covering volumes one to three tonight that's mainly what we're focusing on uh because we were saying like that would have been the better place to end the anime because volume three definitely it it ends at a very epic fight important yeah a big fight and an important point in bell's development although if I recall, it really wasn't that impressive a fight in the actual anime. I think they blew the butt. I think, honestly, they wanted the fifth book just so they could have that massive battle with that huge beast at the end of it. And they really? just wanted to animate the hell out of that. That's my guess. But anyway. <laughs> all, all, I, all I see from people who like pray, who like are big fans of the anime always point to uh, the Bell versus the Minotaur fight as like the best fight in the series. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah? 
I, I you know what yeah. I haven't looked at a lot of sort of fan reaction to it, but uh, but yeah, and I mean honest, uh, and and like I said, that's where we're going to end sort of our main focus because yeah, it, that that is a huge battle, uh, and and you have to really give like the the author credit, like he writes some really good battles, and, and, and I mean they can go on for like fifty, sixty pages, but not feel boring. Yeah, the, like the the choreography <laughs> is good. Oh yeah, and just like, and I like how he. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, <laughs> but I was gonna say I like how he uses different points of view to to really illustrate what's going on on an emotional level as well as sort of just the visual level, you know. Um, so anyway, so let's we're gonna talk about Don Machi. So uh, this series is published in English by Yen On. Uh, they currently have 11 volumes released. Uh, volume 12 is coming out soon, I believe. Um, it is by Fujino Omori. Uh, in Japan, I believe there's only 13 volumes at this point, so we're really not far behind in terms of the English releases. And it is a pure fantasy series. It is not an isekai or anything like that. Um, and it focuses on main character Belle Crenell, who is basically this small town farm kid who, when his last surviving family member passes away, decides that he is going to go to the main city, which is Orario and it is a notable city because right in the center of it is the entrance to a dungeon. And yes, when we say dungeon, it's pretty much what you think. It is multiple, multiple, multiple layers beneath the ground. Each level, of course, inhabited by different monsters. The deeper you get, the more vicious and evil and horrible and deadly it becomes. But it also means that you get more valuable loot the deeper you go. So... There's a whole economy that's basically been created around adventurers who go into the dungeon and get drops from monsters and stuff like that and then bring them up and sell them, which they are then turned into different items and so forth. But the main thing about this story that kind of adds a different dimension to it is that in Orario, the gods have actually descended to the world and they create these families of their own comprised of adventurers and they give each adventurer a blessing which is a very clever way of including the whole leveling up type of mechanic in the story i i, I really had to give it to it when i read the first volume i was like man you're totally including the gaming mechanic of levels, but you're doing it in such a clever way that i can't hate on you for it <laughs> yeah, it's really really well done yeah, they're not just copying it out and uh, calling it EXP or something like that. No, exactly. And I mean, it's just, it's the whole idea that it, really all it is is just saying that as somebody does more, they become stronger. But it's just a way of being able to have an actual visual representation of that growth in development, which is kind of cool. And of course, with the god with the gods giving a blessing, sometimes uh, characters develop special abilities. They can use magic, that kind of stuff. And so, Bell is taken in by this goddess Hestia, who is this lolly, big boobed, twin tailed girl with a ribbon <laughs> that defies uh, gravity <laughs> and uh, well, logic. It aid, well, it aids her assets to defy even more gravity <laughs> yes um <laughs> also very uh, meme worthy <laughs> well i and i have to wonder like when i was when i first saw the design i was like who even thinks about that like seriously like ah uh, anyway um <laughs> so hestia is i you know a relatively lesser goddess and she hasn't even gotten anybody to join her uh familia her family and so bell is her one and only family member and basically the story is about bell's development and growth as an adventurer as his family grows as his circle of friends grows and 
really focuses very much on this concept of becoming a hero, becoming more than just an adventurer, more than just some, you know, powerful guy who goes into the dungeon and kills monsters, but actually becoming like an icon, becoming a hero for people to aspire to and everything else. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's my summary of the series basically left. So uh, let's open up the floor and we can talk about this one. And I guess I'm going to lead this. Uh, which, 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 which floor? Because the dungeon has like uh, endless yeah. floors. Yeah, I was going to say. Well, okay, so let's. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, so first of all, I guess let's let's talk about. Um, so we we have volume number one, and of course, uh, this one of course sees Bell. For the very first time, uh, he's only been an adventurer for what, like a week or two when it starts? Uh, two weeks. I think it was, yeah, two weeks was about. Yeah, I just say. reread the first one in the last few days. Oh, well, there you go. So, Jean Luc, we'll defer to you for things because it's been probably a y two or three years since I read the first volume. <laughs> um, and so I think the the one thing that I really want to focus on. Uh, particularly at the beginning, is this character of Belle Cronell. Because in a lot of other light novels, he may have been sort of like a wishy-washy vanilla character. But in Don Machi, he is probably one of my favorite characters of most light novels that I've read. Yeah, same yeah, here. Definitely got to be one of the favorite uh, main characters. Because even though he's displayed as this really kind of as you said vanilla goody two shoes character um that is a big uh plot point uh in the character's growth especially going on into later volumes well the thing is uh he's i doesn't well i don't see him as a vanilla goody two shoe like uh because the the story is basically based on an epic story like you follow the growth and achievement of a hero and a hero is somebody who is by a uh, society standard is someone who is uh like uh v virtuous like and bell like he follows the code of the hero like he he's good because he embodies everything that's supposed to be heroic so that that's how i see him yeah, and uh, the thing is that he does this all by um, choice, and I think that's very important that it's showing that he's not just, um, well, vanilla, <laughs> use that term again, but he has an ideal that he strives for above everything else. Yeah, well, it, it's not like it's a... a well, uh, you, you said like uh, he does it by choice, but it's more like he's been taught by his grandfather to follow those idea. Well, I, I, I admit there's probably some level of sort of nurture in that. But uh, I mean, definitely we see it in these first. Well, I mean, we always see it in Bell. And this is one of the reasons that I like the character so much. And, and I agree with Kyle's point is that he is constantly being challenged with the difficulties in terms of will he follow his morals and his ideals, which will lead him into a difficult path, or will he take a different path that technically isn't wrong, but is still contrary to what he believes. And I think that's what Kyle's meaning when he says a choice is that he's constantly being given these choices of what path will you take? What decision will you make? And he often will choose the harder path because he believes in it and he knows that it's going to cause him difficulty, but he still chooses it because to him, it is what is right. I think what makes him such a likable protagonist compared to uh, a lot of other novel series that we've gotten licensed in the states is that he's never shown to be that powerful and it's a, very much like almost like an underdog story where like you have the the protagonist at the beginning of the story who's like pretty much a weakling and nobody sees him as taking him that much serious 
and that they think he's going to fail, but like he puts in so much effort into what he does and like he always he takes like like even if he has two choices like you said, he'll take the harder path because he sees that like the outcome is worth working hard for. Well, it's more like he believes in the harder path. Like it, it's like the uh, the other choice that he could have made like he it doesn't like adhere to his ideal yeah and and i think flies makes a really good point because we we often slag on the op hero right the that character who is just way too powerful like like even for like even series where like the story is like oh yeah they're kind of not that strong but they obviously have an have a power that's way above everyone else's like for an example like uh like a certain magical index the main character toma's described as being like oh he's a level zero he's a weakling but he has like one of the most overpowered powers in the entire series <laughs> like it's like it's like when they say he's not powerful in don machi like he is really not powerful like he starts from scratch and he works his ass off to become powerful well his skill is pretty damn op oh what, which though? argonaut uh well yeah there's argonaut but uh the other one like a realist phrase like Oh, it's, yes. It, it just, yes, he started to, as a weakling, but the fact that he gets, like, like yes, in, in like game mechanic, he gets more experience, but, um, like, in the actual book, it's like he learns way faster of the experience that uh, he, he's, uh, he's making. Well, I think, but I think what uh, Fly said, and, and it's true, is that, that particular so the blessing that he has basically the gist of it is is that if he put the more effort he puts into his growth the faster he does grow basically so his growth is like so in other words it kind of allows like we've all i think encountered that thing in our life where you feel like you plateau right yeah so basically what so basically what it allows him to do is to break through that plateau so the as long as he keeps pushing himself he will get better and and i mean yes you're right in a way it it kind of sounds op but and obviously the book does make it clear that he's leveling faster than the average adventurer but i think the fact that there are so many other characters in this series that can and do kick bell's ass yeah. <laughs> it you, you know, you never really feel like, wow, this kid's OP. And even when he does seem to move beyond the average, it's it doesn't feel like a cheat because the kid is pushing himself to death. Like he it's because he is chasing after ideals. It's because he's chasing after a goal. It's because he is pushing himself to be stronger constantly. And because he does make those choices that are hard on himself, that is why he is having that success. And, and I think that that's my thing is that, you know what? I don't care if he becomes a bit OP. I like the fact that at least it feels like he's earning it. It wasn't just given to him. Like, it doesn't feel like he just, like, stumbles upon some random power that, like, he's able to master and, like, defeat all of his enemies within, like, a single volume. Right, yeah. And even the things that, and, and even the powers that he does get that are very powerful, they don't always work. And they don't always take things down, you know? Like, yeah, it's, because it's it, not... Because Zargonaut, like, he has, a, like, a charge time. So it's, yes, a very powerful skill but at the same time there's a, a limit to it absolutely and that and that's the thing where i that's where i love bell's character and and i think you know between flies and kyle and, and jl i think you guys are all hitting it you know on the head is that you have this character who has decent heroic morals who will take the difficult path to stay true to those morals even though he knows it's difficult going to be harder and that even though he is becoming strong, it's because of hard work and effort that he's becoming strong. It isn't just that, you know, yeah, he found a cheat or somebody said to him, oh, here, you know, 
use this item and you'll go up 10 levels, you know, or anything like that. Like, well, or, you know, you're reincarnated by a goddess who says, pick one superpower from this book list of book and uh, you can have it. You well, know, like. he, he doesn't pick the book. He's ended the book. <laughs> well, but even, and, and again, right? Like, uh, I mean, that's obviously a, a, a whole plot point with uh, Freya. Uh, and, you know, it's the same thing, but even then, I guess, you know, but Firebolt, that, that Firebolt spell that he gets, I mean, even then, like, it's useful, but it's not OP. Oh, because it's cold yeah, range. The, the only, the only thing, the only thing good about it is that, like, luckily he gets a skill that takes a very short amount of time to cast. It's like a not a long chant sort of like magic, so he's able to fire it off pretty quickly, but it's not really that powerful. No, and it kind of matches his skill set, right? Like Bell, uh, you know, Bell is always described as the white rabbit because he's got white hair, red eyes, and because the kid moves like really fast. Yeah, his agility is uh, in the top. Yeah, and so like that's it, it, and I think that's where that whole firebolt thing works really well with the character and with the character. I mean, for lack of a, a, you know, using a gamer term, his build, right? It's, it, it all works, you know, the fact that he uses daggers, the fact that he's got this really quick spell that isn't super powerful, but definitely can be fired off quickly in quick succession. Um, you know, his agility maxed out, like, it, it really does all just kind of work together. And again, like, it, it, it's not a spell that like, oh, yeah, I take down minotaurs with one hit with this thing look at me go right like it's not op but useful absolutely <laughs> yeah it's uh i mean when you look at like real true spell casters you just see how out of its league in terms of uh just pure destructive power it is because there's one well there's several spell casters you could choose um who could clear out just hundreds of enemies with just a single spell. And you, you got Bell's firebolt and he can annoy someone. Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of the extent of its power. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, if you look at the climax of the third volume with the, the epic uh, finale, like the, um, the Loki familia shows up as Bell's about to fight off this Minotaur single handedly. And you can just you just think like the Loki familia, like all the members are so powerful they could easily like take out this Minotaur with, like within a second. But like for Bell, it's like a life and death like battle that like he's like fighting with all his might and it's like really tough for him. But like he he doesn't like give up and let the other stronger uh his stronger comrades take it for him. He like he wants to prove himself. Yeah, and and exactly. And that's that is where I think you have this really great character that it, it, it really, uh, it really does. It works. Um, now, <laughs> now let's just talk for a moment. We don't have to dwell on this too long, but I mean, the title is, is it wrong to try to pick up <laughs> girls in a dungeon? And I say it's an unfortunate title because it makes it sound like this is a really cheesy harem type st series with, uh, Bell Mac either Mac dadding on a bunch of girls or being the clueless protagonist where every single girl's madly in love with him. The girls fight with each other to get to him, and he's just a complete idiot when it comes to the girls. Yeah, I almost didn't pick up uh, this series at first because of the title. Like uh, when it came out in anime format, like uh, I waited like maybe a year before. Uh, like uh, watching it because the the title like straight off uh, scared me. Like the title, the title makes me the title makes me think that the protagonist is gonna come off as some unlikable like Casanova guy who's full of himself and thinks he deserves all the women. Right. But, like it's it's quite the opposite, pretty much. And the irony is, is that Bell couldn't be any further from that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, now, I mean, there are sort of harem elements to it. Uh, there is a cast of, obviously, we have Hestia, who, you know, cares very deeply for Belle. Uh, in Volume 2, we have the addition of Lily, 
uh, his supporter, uh, who is very affectionate about Bell. But and then we have this the girl Eyes Wallenstein, who Bell. It's kind of this is the thing that I want to talk about because this is what I always struck me as is interesting about this book was that as much as Bell Eyes is kind of presented initially as kind of this love interest, you never really feel like Bell's in love with her. Well, it's it's more like a, a crush than like real love. I I mean, it's more like he's like he's attracted to her, but uh, more in a like narration type of way. Yes. Like I I don't know how it how it is later in the series, but for like the first three volumes, it feels more like like he thinks he's attracted to her like physically, but he it's more like he idealizes her as like someone he wishes he could be like to be like as strong as she is. As a woman, he's definitely attracted to her, but as an adventurer, she's his um ideal. Everything that he believes that an adventurer should be and so you know that's why he gets really fixated on her well also like bell is 14 years old so it is a little bit young like yes he could be like attracted sexually to her but uh i guess that he's still a bit young and like i don't know i see more like that he would be admiring her and eventually it would develop like uh into maybe love or maybe not like like i i feel like once his like power level starts to get a lot closer to eyes's i feel like it would change from idolization into romantic attraction but like as early as this into the story yeah because i, I think to this point he he feels like he's not worthy. Oh yeah, like, definitely. He's, de- he's definitely pe- he's definitely a pessimistic kind of guy at the start of the series. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, and I mean, you know, at the very start of the series, of course, he's humiliated in front of eyes mm-hmm. and Loki familia, right? Um, you know, what did they call him, Tomato Boy or whatever? Uh, so yeah, I agree. I I think that his eyes is much more of like an idolization and. And to your point too, Jean Luc, like he, you're right. He's this. He seems like such an innocent kid who really doesn't know much about the world. And it's funny because when he starts the series, it sounds like his grandfather was kind of a womanizer. <laughs> you know, yeah. his, his grandfather filled his head with this whole idea of like a harem is a man's romance, right? <laughs> well. It's a spoiler, so I won't say. Like, uh, it's not told in the first three volume, but when when you have more information on his grandfather, get definitely a womanizer. Well, yeah, okay, definitely. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And, and but it's funny because you know, Bell does come initially in the first book. Bell does have some of these ideas in his head about this whole idea of, you know. It, um, saving the woman in a dungeon and you know all these kind of like things that his grandfather's put into his head and all of that gets dashed basically when he comes face to face with eyes and when he becomes humiliated because he's so frightened initially because of this minotaur that gets loose in the upper levels and almost squashes bell basically it's like all of that gets thrown away and is replaced instead by just this, like you said, idolization. This, this, it's a goal as opposed to a romance. And even as the series goes on, it's much, it still sounds more like it's not so much that he even wants to romance her as it is that he just wants to feel that they can stand on equal footing with each other and they can. You know, it's it's more like he wants to be able to adventure in the dungeon with her on equal terms as opposed to, oh, I want to get with her or whatever. And I always kind of laugh because I'm like, he, he says that in the first book, a man, a harem is a man's dream or a man's romance. And, and then I'm like, you know, as you get into the series, dude, you're developing a harem, but you're completely not seeing it. <laughs> to me, like the Japanese title is, is a little bit more... Um accurate to what the series is actually is 
Uh, not that uh, the English title is wrong, but uh, well, it's actually a really good uh, title, but um, like uh, in Japanese, from my understanding of it, like they have um, the word deai. Deai is mainly like an encounter, a meeting. So you can translate it as like pick up. Uh, pick up in girl in the dungeon but uh, it's also about like a meeting or like d developing relationship with people n not necessarily uh, like uh, yeah like romantically yeah i get you like pick up makes it sound kind of like you know trashy hookup. <laughs> from what I, from what i've seen on from what i've seen online the actual translation is instead of pick up girls it's literally just is it wrong that i want to meet you in a dungeon which sounds a lot more uh, digestible. Yeah, so when, when I read the title in Japanese, that, that's what pops in my head. Like it's a, it's a meeting, it's a, an encounter, and it really describes the, the first few pages. Like when he, he meets eyes in the dungeon, like it, it shapes his, um, his motivation and uh, from there, and it... And throughout the series, like it's all of the meetings uh, of people, um, well, everyone that he meets inside the dungeon or outside because of his job as an adventurer inside the dungeon, it what brings him like his uh, richness and uh, like his development. Just to your point about that, the title and how to reread the title. Uh, in volume number two, of course, we have the addition of the character Lily, who is this supporter character who her main function is to just be that, a support to the frontline adventurers. So uh, having intelligence, uh, keeping all the information about the different levels, what kind of monsters there are, how best to uh, harvest the drop items that the monsters leave behind and everything else. And Initially, she is incredibly distrustful and, well, basically hates adventurers and for very good reason. Uh, but it is because of her experiences with Belle in the dungeon and how Belle treats her that eventually turns her to be his friend. The frontliners like the shit on the support. It's almost like a real life video game. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's true, right? I mean, it, it that's the one that's another thing that I I like about this series is that adventurers aren't really good people. Yeah, it's it's a job. Like uh adventurers in that book like to me it sounds more like it's a uh, natural job, like they're mining resource in uh inside the dungeon and the supporter like to me they're doing a support job but like in every job like you have um, often have like a position or a specific job that is viewed uh, with eight by your co-workers so to me it kind of represent that well yeah it's pretty much like it's pretty much like any other job where like uh, the adventurers are like in the front lines and like the supporters are important because they're there to support them that's the whole reason why they're there but, like, the adventurers have, like, an ego sort of problem where they're, like, well, we're killing the monsters and, like, charging into the dungeon. So, like, we're doing pretty much all the work. So, like, I'm just going to look down on you because you're just, like, following behind me. Yeah, it was really in that second volume with Lily and, and how she sees adventurers and how she's treated by adventurers that I I think that was the point where as much as I liked Belle's character in volume one... That was where, to me, I thought, okay, this is where this kid is different. Because even though he is an adventurer, and even though he wants to be a successful adventurer, there there's still a moral code that he lives by that he won't sacrifice. And I think, like, one of the reasons for that is probably because uh, he, he's alone. Like, uh, he didn't, like, join a group that, like, he had to follow like what was socially established before. Like he goes in with his own moral because he's alone. Yeah, I 
I think that's a I think that's a good way of uh, taking a look at it, and it could also explain as the series goes on why it is like minded individuals kind of gather around him because he he really is only going to bring people into his circle that meet that ideal, right? Yeah, and Nessia will make sure that only that scenario happens. <laughs> Yes, the overprotective Spoilers. over overprotective lolly goddess will make sure that things will stay on track. <laughs> yeah, but overall, I, I really like like uh, Lily's development, like uh, her story overall. Like, uh, and as I said, like the the whole series follow a bit of um, like. Uh, well, follow the standard of an epic story. And inside epic story, you all also have like uh, treason as a, a main theme. And that's what happens in uh, volume two. And what I find interesting about Lily is mainly how she surpasses what she did and tries to redeem herself. Well, she occupies a really interesting place in the series. And I mean, I, I think it's... It's it's definitely like it's funny because her character, the way she's drawn and the way she's depicted, she seems like this really like young girl. And yet she is kind of like the voice of reason in the whole. And, and I mean, that continues on for the whole series. But uh, but definitely, like you see that in the second book, even when she's supporting Bell, you know, even though she's plotting other things, like you said, that whole idea of treason, because she figures Belle is just another adventurer. Uh, but in volume three, you see that as well, right? That whole uh, idea of she's kind of the more the level-headed one. Yeah. Yeah, because from what I can remember, um, she's been an adventurer all her life. Uh, she's been in this role um, and just seen all sides of adventurers, and she's really grown the cynical outlook of it. Well, yeah, she was, what was it, like, she was sold into it or something? Like Her parents that... were part of the familia, yeah. and then when she was born, she was automatically in there as well. And, of course, it's a familia that's very dysfunctional and for all sorts of horrible reasons that you find out later on. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, actually, they do discuss that a bit in Volume 2, though, don't they? Yes. About yeah. why the familia is like that, is that... The whole idea of the basically it's it's the god of like wine or whatever is the is their god their deity and he's created this wine that is basically a drug and it's so addictive that the members of the familia have no qualms about stepping on other adventurers as well as their own to be able to get the chance to have that wine like it's it's interesting how we have a lot of different themes woven into this series without it feel like you're getting hit over the head with morality or whatever, right? Like, I mean, there's definitely that element of like drugs and drug abuse and addiction that's kind of woven into it. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of later and later volumes. There's all sorts of darker sort of more societal things that are brought into the series. Uh, and, you know, Lily, Lily's character really does bring forward that whole idea of the fact that adventurers can be abusive and even to their own, that they're not necessarily all going to be heroes or, or even if they're not heroes, like, you know, Bete is a bit of a dick. We see that in volume one. Yeah. Well, he's a douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he totally is. Oh my God. Like what a jerk. <laughs> um, you know, but, and, and it's funny cause I find that with Loki familia, the more that we see them, the less impressed I am with them as individuals. Now, I mean, I've only read two volumes of the spinoff series, so maybe I'd feel differently if I read more of it. But when you read the main series again, like it's, it, I don't know, like the, it's, it is, you can really see the clear distinction about why it is. Bell seems to be the one who is on the path of the hero. Whereas everybody else is just on the path of, the adventurer or almost like a mercenary kind of path, you know? Well, for the other, like it's their job, like they're bringing money home. But like as before, because um, 
like uh, Bell's Familia is just starting. Like he has the choice to basically follow whatever paths he wants. Well, because you're starting from zero. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, when the book starting from zero in another world. <laughs> <laughs> totally and, other podcast <laughs> and it, it, it's like it, if you're doing a, an analogy of uh like the the whole world how it works it's like familia are big company and bell is just starting his own startup and usually like startup are able to maneuver more freely so they can bring new technology and new ways of thinking and well, that's what Bell does. Like he, he brings, well, throughout the series, like you see him becoming an hero because he, he brings a new way of doing things that the other familia were, since they were too big and uh, bulky to just uh, like uh, overnight change stuff. Like they, they seem like what he's doing, it, it's working. That's actually a really good analogy. I never really thought of it that way. Yeah, especially since they're so new, they get to essentially uh, define it as they're going. Well, it's true. I mean, in the first book, like Hestia and Bell live in the basement of this collapsed church. Like it's basically, they're basically squatters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, even even the goddess has to have like a part time job just to to get food on the table. Like several part time jobs. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and even to to get Bell a half decent weapon, she basically has to go into debt for you know, what could amount to centuries if they aren't successful. <laughs> and, Don't you uh, wish every goddess in every light novel series was as hardworking? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, true story, right? Like, like, like Hestie is not just a meme, guys. She's a good character in her own right. No, well, but that's, but you're right. Like, I mean, she's, uh, you definitely see it more, I would say, in later in later volumes where her personality, I would say, comes through more, especially as she's tending to more than just Belle. Because, uh, I mean, in the beginning, when it's just her and Belle, there is that little bit of sort of childish lovey-doveyness that she has for him. But in terms, But in terms of her wanting to protect him and care for him and see him succeed... You're right. There's a lot more to her character. Like she is a very motherly character in a lot of ways. And, and yeah, her willingness to sacrifice herself and, uh, you know, when you see the other gods and how they're just basically there to be entertained and, and they, they, they freely will use people for their own frivolous entertainment. And then you have Hestia who, basically puts aside her pride as a goddess to work as a part-time employee to bring in money. <laughs> you know? I mean, it, it really shows because like, instead of calling themselves guilds, which is basically what they are, it, they call it familia. So like Hestia and Bell's relationship actually feels like a family, like a family sort of unit. And then, like you have these other these other gods that, like, well, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I, I think that uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Estia in Greek mythology, she's supposed to be the goddess of family. I don't know um, much about Greek mythology, but I'll take that. I thought it was architecture. Uh, well, I'm gonna have to look this. I up. I was gonna now. say I'm, I'm yeah. gonna have to look it up because I, I thought time for Google Foo, right? I thought it was. Uh, I, I thought, if I recall, I thought she was like the goddess of the hearth. Like, uh, like the whole idea was, uh, you know, it was she's about actually, homestead she's actually and bull. stuff like that. Uh, yeah. According to Google, she's technically bull. Yeah. Of architecture and family. Yeah, she is the virgin goddess of the hearth, architecture, and the right ordering of domesticity, the family, the home, and the state. So, The real yeah. question is if... We is were this, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the real the real question is 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 the real Hestia a big boob lolly? I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. 
Greek mythology might have been a lot more interesting that way. No. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, well on, that's that. No. On that note, like uh, we can talk about more generally about the the god and goddess. Like in, in that series in general. Um, well, of course, they borrow a lot of god and goddesses from uh, different mythology, but they really feel like uh, when you read like. Uh, old story about Greek or Norse mythology, like the, the gods, uh, unlike in other anime where you have these sort of all-powerful beings uh, that are either good or evil, like in this case, they feel more like uh, they're, well, actual Greek or Norse god, like they're uh, neither good, neither evil, they're mischievous, jealous, like they're they're well like i remember mythology is supposed to be yeah benevolent they are not that's no. for certain no and, and you're you're actually you're right jail it's 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 true like in, in a lot of the polytheistic type religions particularly as you said like greek and norse mythology gods are basically like super powered human beings like they're they have these powers, but really in terms of they're they still are just have as many fallacies as a human being does. Like they're, you know, they're, they aren't necessarily always doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And they, they don't always, you know, help in a way that would be good or bad. It's mostly seems to be, they do things for their own benefit or how they want things to work out, regardless of the feelings of the people that worship them. You see, especially that in uh, Estia and Freya, like Estia, like, she, yes, she wants to protect Belle, but at the same time, she's jealous of Eyes because Eyes, like the encounter that Belle had with Eyes is what propelled him forward and not her, uh, like her, her teaching or her protecting Belle that gave him like, uh, like progression. And uh, Freya, like, yeah, she can seem like a, a bad guy because she, well, more of an antagonist than a bad guy, but, uh, like, she's doing it out of, like, pure entertainment and jealousy at the, at the same time. Yeah, that's one thing that you don't really see in the, particularly in the first three volumes. There's not, like, some sort of, mustache twirling villain you know like it, it it's it's not like there's a really really bad guy it's it is it's it's really just people manipulating other people because of their bored or they want to be entertained or you know it's just a toy to them right like like you said like freya the way that she sees bell is he's just something that she's curious about something that she's interested in and I think there's that element of, you know, even though she doesn't necessarily know what his blessing is, because she sees his growth, there there becomes that curiosity of just how far can I push him forward? Yeah, uh, speaking of Freya, yeah, she's definitely uh, doing a lot of things behind the scenes to kind of like um, put Bell into positions where he has to be... Um, well, she puts trials in his path that he has to overcome. Right. Like in volume number one, of course, there's the whole monster uh, festival where they basically train monsters from the dungeon. And Freya essentially arranges for a number of monsters to get loose. And pretty much the, the worst of the bunch ends up targeting Belle. And it's, well, it's because she makes it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and so so she yeah you're right in the first book definitely like freya is an antagonist but but yeah it's it's interesting that she's not like a villain that she necessarily wants to see bell fail if anything she's like i'm gonna put you into a position to see if you can succeed and and it's weird because in a lot of ways she ends up helping him <laughs> oh yeah definitely 
Yeah, like, I mean, because she puts him into those situations, like, she's the one who arranges for him to find Firebolt, the, the grimoire or whatever, the spell book, to learn Firebolt, which, you know, is a big game changer for him in the dungeon. Uh, you know, she forces these monsters on him to test him to see whether he can move ahead. Uh, even we were talking that huge titanic battle at the end of book three between bell and the minotaur the minotaur has been trained to fight by freya's right hand man for the whole purpose of attacking bell <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i'd say it's more about her just testing him as he like goes into his like adventuring career because if she's trying to actually defeat him she's not doing a very good job she, no she him. don't want to defeat him no like i get the impression it's the opposite actually she wants to see him become uber powerful like she's more it's more like she's curious and entertained by seeing how yeah, far she, he'll she go she wants him for for yeah, herself that, that's what but i she, but that's what i meant pretty much like if if she's trying to not do that and trying to actually be in a villain, she's doing a really crappy job <laughs> at it. But I don't think I don't think that's what she's meant to be doing at all. No, yeah. because uh, when she sees Belle, she sees this like crystal aura, like this bunch of possibilities, and it's she wants to acquire it, but at the same time, it's like she wants the diamond to be uh, fully shaped before she acquires it. So she puts a bunch of obstacle in his way so that it will shape him into the perfect crystal. Right. Well, and again, I mean, even just that whole idea of in the very first book, it starts off with Bell being confronted by this minotaur. Uh, you know, he's, he's scared literally to the point where he can't move. He's rescued by eyes he gets humiliated because of it in the the inn at the tavern, whatever, because of Bette and his, you know, boisterous dickery and, uh, you know, and, and, and then of course in book three, Freya intentionally makes it so that Belle can face probably the worst minotaur that she can create. And it's all because she knows that, how can he get better if this is going to be a phobia that always holds him up? So better that he fight through this and survive and overcome it or die. It doesn't matter which happens. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she like, it's interesting, her ambivalence, right? She's kind of like, well, I want you to succeed because if you succeed, then I'm right. But on the flip side, if you fail, then you were not as good as what I thought you were. So that's probably a better outcome, too. Yeah, gods can be weird like that. <laughs> well, that, that's what I like about the the gods in the, in that book. And well, like it, it doesn't show in the three first volume, but uh, later on, Soma, like the the least god, like the development he gets, like it, it's wow. And and gods like Ganesha and that guy uh, is weird. You know, Loki herself. <laughs> I am Ganesha. <laughs> um <laughs> is this is this after season one stuff because i don't know anything about oh, it. oh well you know you see ganesha well i mean maybe not in the anime but he's in book one because his family is well, the one that actually organizes is that the is that the guy with the elephant yeah yeah i yeah i haven't read volume one or watched the show in a while so. yeah yeah, he's the elephant mask guy. Basically, if you say that, most people know what you're talking about. <laughs> but you're right. And like, even the whole, um, the gatherings of the gods and everything else, and when the gods even talk to each other, it's interesting just even to see how they react to each other and interact with each other. Um, I like, that's the thing that, and again, like, I, I love this series because it works on so many different levels. Like, there's the whole dungeon and what is the dungeon and, and what, how did the dungeon form and all that kind of stuff. There's all that mystery aspect, but then you have this whole other level with the gods and, and just that they're so unpredictable, like who knows what's going to happen. And then you've populated with all of these really interesting characters who 
all get a lot of plot development and character development. I mean, Belle obviously gets the most, but as you said, like Lily has, you know, different things that happen with her. I mean, in the first three books, definitely, but that there's a lot of growth that she has even beyond that. So yeah, even in, in the eight volume, you have a, a bit of a development. With yeah. Her. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like there's a lot, uh, you know, it just, it's got so many different layers that all kind of work together. And that's why I say to people all the time, I'm like, man, I, I wish they had just allowed him because the author initially just called it the Familia myth or Familia Chronicles, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Like I seem um, to remember that that was the under yeah. the web novel. That's what it was called. Was like, I think you got it uh, backwards. I'm pretty sure the Dan Machi was the original web novel, and then he wanted to change it to Familia Myth, but then the publisher wouldn't let him. I think it was something along those lines. So he, yeah, so he just made it a subtitle to kind of screw it in. Yeah, I'm. I can't remember. Uh, uh... I'm gonna I, I'm gonna Google it because more you know. Google foo, yeah Google foo. <laughs> um, I I think he explained yeah, it. Yeah, I, I remember. Though, for people who actually read something. those, yeah. No, Fujino uh, Fujino Amori wrote the story under the title Familia Myth as his entry for the fourth G A Bunko Award, and he won the great prize and received an offer for publication. So it was initially titled Familia Myth. Oh, okay. And then the editor changed it. <laughs> yeah, cuz cuz the editor the editor knew, well, you're not going to sell this to Otaku like this. You got to you got to <laughs> The title has to be longer. You have to you have the title has to be the synopsis even if it makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> It has to be longer, and it has to make it sound like there's going to be girls. Though I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know if Don Machi is the first series to start the trend of having a title being an entire paragraph long. Is that seem? No, I think it was. Um, uh, well, actually, uh, at Otakuton, I asked the same uh, question to uh, to Sam in one of uh, the panel, and uh, I think he said it was. Um, like Oleimo. Oh, yeah. Oh, did or and oh. that would yeah, make sense. Yeah. Because I, from memory, I think uh, it's one of the first one I remember to have a super long yeah. title that can fit in a binder. Yeah. Well, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my yeah, little the, the anime for Oleimo came out like many years before the first novel of Damachi even got published. So. Yeah, I, I just took a little sense. Google foo and it was August 2008 was when the light novel for Oremo came out. So that was, yeah, years before Damachi was first yeah, published. Yeah, Damachi didn't start till 2013. So yeah, you're, so yeah, you're, you're, you could be very correct there that my little sister can't be this cute. When are we getting this license? Come on. Which really doesn't seem like a long title given some of the ones that we've seen now. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> well the the thing is it's like when something is popular like they build up from there so i think from Oreimo it was like a, a competition to see which title can be the longest and the more most interesting <laughs> well i Probably. you know what i think a I mean, just as an aside, because, you know, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the Dalmachi, but I, I think part of the reason is because there's so many light novels released that they don't think people are going to pick up the light novel and actually read the synopsis or the blurb on the back of it. So they want the title to basically tell you what the book is about, because that's going to make it more likely that you'll actually pick it up. I, I swear to God, I think that's why they did it. I mean, I could be completely off wrong. I feel like in Don Machi's case, it's going to be a giant 180 and people are going to be like reading into the first volume and be like, this is nothing like the title says. <laughs> yeah, but at, at the same time, like I remember uh, seeing in, like, uh, uh, like uh, a special uh, footage like uh, with a movie and the uh, making of and they were talking about the, the title and... Uh, they said, oh, we want the title to be exactly 
what the movie is all about and they called it robocop it works it tells you exactly in two words what the movie is about so i don't think you necessarily need a whole paragraph to tell me what the, the book is all about you're right but when you consider how weird and wacky some of these books get like light novels you can't necessarily sum up like a light novel like what are you going to call you know vending machine that doesn't tell you anything <laughs> <laughs> you have you have to make your title as ridiculous and memorable as possible. It's like it's like when you watch some like commercials on TV, and like sometimes you'll watch them and be like, "This is like the stupidest thing I've ever seen." But like you'll never forget that stupid commercial. True story. Well, like, I it's mean, doing it's, its and job. it's funny how well, and it's funny too, like how even if you can't remember the title, you just remember the gist of it. Like that one, like Isekai Hot Mom. Like <laughs> I don't know what it's titled. <laughs> I don't know what it's titled. I just know it's like the Isekai Milf. <laughs> like, 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 you know. <laughs> like, like, now I'm now I'm confused. I don't even know which one you're talking about. Oh, now. you don't? Oh. Uh, oh, would you like a Is mother it, you... who could attack twice? Oh, that and one has a party. <laughs> area of effect that sacks yeah something. it's something <laughs> yeah you're right yeah it is it's it's something like that it's like yeah basically it's about a guy who gets isekai but his mom comes with him as a support character but she's way more op than he is <laughs> i'm i'm more excited for a isekai pizza parlor there you go right <laughs> i'm all about the isekai pizza parlor it'll only be good if they include like some re pizza recipes at the back of it I'm expecting it to be the same sort of feeling as killing a three three hundred slime or whatever. Hopefully. Yes, it's got to be. A, <laughs> oh, it has to be a warm, fuzzy light novel, and there has to be pizza recipes. If it doesn't, if it isn't that, I'll be very disappointed. But anyway, that's getting way off topic. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what kind of topic do you want on uh, your pizza? Yeah. <laughs> What kind of topping do you want on your pizza? All right, it's topping, world? not topping. Yeah. I swear to God, if they put pineapple in this book, I'm dropping it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hawaiian pizza is good. Oh, or, or some alternate world version of it. <laughs> ultimate, alter, I'll, if, I'll, I'll be out if they do sardines. I'll just be like, nah, nah, you can't do that. Anyway, um, so Don Machi... <laughs> <laughs> funny funny how talking about just the title of the series can take you off on yeah. like a massive tangent right <laughs> we could do <coughs> now i'm choking uh please don't die yeah, we could do a whole we could probably do a whole episode just talking about titles we should do that someday yes. we, we were talking about that right oh, well, we were... well there you yeah. go there you go that's uh Topic. Yeah, we were talking. We were talking about that, right? We said we're gonna we're gonna research light novel titles in Japan, and then we'll do a competition and just come up with wacky titles and see if the, everyone can guess: is it a real title or it, did we make it up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in any case, okay. So, so with Don Machi, then so. Uh, of course, so we have book one, which introduces the character, introduces sort of the world, everything else. We have that whole encounter with the Minotaur, and then he meets Eyes, who becomes kind of his idol, his goal, his that that direction, the beacon, whatever we want to call her, that he's chasing after, that helps his development. And so then we have volume two, where we meet Lily, who is a supporter. She meets Belle. And basically, she means to swindle him and steal from him. And then in the end, realizes that he's actually really just this good, decent kid. And she decides to become his friend. And um, and then we have book three, which basically... So in book three, then we have Eyes wanting to train Belle. And then we have basically the Minotaur fight. Like, that's pretty much book three, right? <laughs> if yeah. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty much just a straightforward training arc. Yeah. Tournament arc. No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the part of the movie where, like, you know, the music plays in the background and there's just a montage of, like, Bell getting his ass kicked. Um, 
anyway. the eye of the tiger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, and I think that that's, you know, and again, like if, if book one established the world, book two establishes that adventurers aren't great people. And then book three basically establishes that, you know, Bell really is low tier in this world, but by pushing himself, he might become somebody. Because book three basically ends with him fighting this Minotaur for, like, it's it was a long, it was like, what, 50 pages or longer, that fight? It's like the uh, entire last third of the Yeah, fight. like, it's it's a long fight. And, and this was something that we said earlier, but, you know, I'm going to definitely bring it up now that we're actually recording, is that Fujino Omori, the way that he writes fight scenes like that, these big, epic, titanic life altering fight scenes they're fantastic like i don't think i've read any other fight scene in a book that was even half that long that kept me as interested as i was in that fight scene yeah just uh strictly in uh literary terms i haven't come across another light novel author that can do it as well as he can like it's very easy to follow what's going on like the way he describes like all the like attacks and like the uh he has a good way of describing like the chore the setting and like the choreography of like the fight to the point where like you you'll never be confused about what's going on while reading it. Well, and I like too that he always has a way of having other characters seeing the fight. And uh like we mentioned, you know, Loki Familia, a couple of them show up as Bell is fighting this Minotaur. And initially, they're kind of like, oh, well, let's just, you know, take this thing out. I mean, this kid's going to get his ass kicked. And isn't it like the leader of the Loki Familia who tells everybody to hold off? And because it's, you know, he's like, no, this is his fight. Like, you know, this is going to define him as a person. So he needs to finish it alone. I can't remember... Um, I, was. I think that I stopped them from intervening, but uh, I think that also uh, like uh, the the Hobbit, I don't remember his name, but uh, the the leader, uh, like he, I think he also uh, hold everyone back. And and so you know, having those other characters that are strong who could easily win the battle, having them sort of act almost like, well, I mean, JL, you were talking about how this is written sort of like an epic. And to yeah. me, and to me in these battles, these are sort of like that, uh, you know, the chorus that they used to use in Greek plays where the chorus would be used to kind of comment on things and provide commentary and context uh, for the audience. I kind of feel like that, happens in this book too where these characters from loki familia they're commenting on what's going on they're they're kind of acting as our eyes because we see the choreography described we also have all the description of bell's emotions and feelings and everything else going into it but then having these experienced adventurers being commenting on you know, his speed and this and that and the next thing. I just find like all of those different points of view and ways of telling it, it just makes it such a, a really satisfying experience that at the end of it, when Bell has won, obviously, you really do feel like, man, this kid has overcome a huge hurdle. And if he doesn't level up, we just got cheated. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that goes back to like, you know, what we were talking about when we were talking about Bell's character was that, you know, yes, he's got these abilities that might be OP with another character, but because of the way that Don Machi is written and because of what Bell has to go through, man, it never feels like he's OP. It always feels like he is just busting his but to try and get every last scrap of leveling up that he possibly can. You know, no, nothing feels easy for this kid. Well, on that note, uh, I just found your answer to the number of page. I was just checking the book. So it goes from 138 to 193. Uh, okay. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, so well, about the last To, to go with what you were just saying, like the, the last 
uh, four lines of uh, the book. Like it's period of employment, one month, total monster slain, 3001. And three days ago, he became by far the fastest adventurer on record to reach level two. So we we have the answer at the end of volume three that like all of his um, like uh, hard work, like it, it paid off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and think about that. In one month, he has killed 3,000 monsters, right? So he's yeah. killing a hun- at least 100 monsters a day if their months are as long as our months. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe I shouldn't assume, but, you know, I don't think he's ever said anything different, so let's say it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember uh, it being the, the case. Like, yeah. I know, like, in uh, Realist Hero, they really state that it's different, but uh, in this one, I don't remember. No, I don't think he ever gets into it that much. Well, I, I reread, like uh, like I said, I reread the first volume uh, in the past few days, and uh, it wasn't in there, so. Yeah. So, I mean, just based on the assumption that it's a 30-day month, yeah, this kid's by himself is killing 100 monsters a day. At least. And also, you have to... F- uh, like not figure out, but uh, you have to like uh, take in, uh, into account that um, like the, the two first week, uh, it was really a weak adventure. Like he didn't have his skill. And it's the last two weeks in which he was growing like crazy. So like the 3001 monster slain, like most of them are just two weeks. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. Well, and I mean, again, right, the, you know, we, he's also using in the beginning, he's using really basic equipment, like cheap, you know, equipment that breaks easily. He doesn't get the Hestia knife until later on. Um, Like, I think that's what, like, towards the end of book one or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's the end of yeah, he the does. first volume. He doesn't get to, he doesn't get to use it until uh, until the final fight in the first. Yeah, it, yeah. Allow, it allows him to uh, slay the silverback. Right. Yeah. Hestia has it with her when the, he encounters her. Right. If I yeah. remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, so yeah, so he's using lousy equipment up until that point. Yeah. I mean, it's. And like I said, you know, to me, that is why I really like the character. He's, he is kind of like that. He really is in a lot of ways, that perfect character uh, that has virtue, is heroic, but doesn't feel unattainable or that he is, you know, so far set apart from everybody else that he seems unrealistic, even in the world that he inhabits, you know? Yeah, we're talking about the irregular at Magic High School earlier. Oh, God. <laughs> that, that's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tatsu is basically a perfect cell from Dragon Ball. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's good you're talking about that because that's the because that's the next series I was going to start after this. So, <laughs> like, and and again, that doesn't necessarily make a series horrible, but. You know, it would defeat the whole point of this series like this, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even though we're talking about the first three books and that's mainly what we've talked about. I mean, I've gotten up to the end of volume 11 and and the series really is about Bell's growth. It really is about Bell's development and, and, you know, his his journey. So it, it would make no sense for bell to be starting off like as this crazy powerful person right at the beginning. Cause it would be a totally different series in that case. Yeah. I really, you know what I got to say, like uh Fujino Omori is definitely, I think one of the better in terms of what we have available in English. I, I have to think he is one of the best light novel writers that we currently have. Uh, you know, I always just find Don Machi's books, so readable and so enjoyable and they pull me in and it never feels like I'm plodding through things and the writing always seems so strong, which is funny when you consider that Don Machi is some of the longest light novels that we have in English, particularly when you start getting a little bit later in the series. 
like six, seven. Once you start getting past, uh, oh yeah. Uh, once once you get to volume seven, it gets like ridiculously long. Yeah, well, I mean, ridiculous by light novel standards. Yeah, I mean, uh, on average, well, like the like the longest volume in the series right now is a side story volume, which is not very typical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you've, you've got books in Dalmachi that are over 400 pages, almost 500 pages long, which yeah, by light novel standards, that's almost two and a half books. <laughs> that's almost a novel. <laughs> I know. Right. And, and yet I find Doesn't I read them light. just as fast, if not faster than some books that are only 200, 250 pages. Yeah, it's definitely uh, Dama the Damachi volumes. Uh, some of them are just ones that I can't put down once I start getting into them. I mean, I'll go through them in just like two days. It's just, just kind of crazy how they grip you like that. Yeah. Well, and I think it's too, because that's, you know, that's the thing. Like, because Bell does fail. You know, like Bell does get beaten. And I mean, that happens in these first three books. That's not a spoiler for even what happens in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like Bell's always getting beaten. And, and there is really that attraction of how is he going to come back from this? You know, how is he going to rise above this? Will he be able to, what's going to change things for him? Uh, you know, like, and because you like the character and because you like, I like the other characters too. It, it, you know, it, it just, yeah. Like I, I am very involved with the whole journey of the characters and the family and what's going to happen to all of them. And, you know, it, it like that. And, and, and again, on top of that, it's just really well-written stuff. I just, Yeah. A really good series. I, you know, it's it's always one that I say is one of my favorites, and I tell people, check it out. Ignore the title, just check it out. Definitely ignore so the much... title. <laughs> oh, like it. It really is one of those light novels that I just I am constantly just heartbroken over the title. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I'll be reading it. I'll be reading it at work, and somebody will look at the title and be like, "Oh my god, what kind of nonsense are you reading?" I'm like, "No, you don't understand." <laughs> It's actually really good. <laughs> yeah, I had the I same the uh, conversation stupid. like uh, last year at the, at my job. I, I was reading it uh, during my break, and uh, one of my uh, coworker he was, "Is it really good?" Well, yeah. Don't just buy the title. Like, <laughs> the title is <laughs> <Yeah>. weird, <laughs> but it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. So unfortunate the title. Wow. If there's any one message that we want to get out in this podcast, it is ignore the title, read the book. It's so much better than the title. <laughs> <laughs> and also the anime. I mean, you know, let's talk a little bit about the anime because I mean, we mentioned it earlier very briefly, but the anime chops out so much stuff. Yeah, it's not bad per se, but uh, yeah, I would have liked it to be more like faithful to what's in the book i would say that's more like a trend with like a huge majority of like novel adaptations like don machi isn't the first series to no yeah kind of poor somewhat poorly adapt the source material well i have a feeling that they felt that um don machi was just going to be another one of those kind of um throwaway adaptations where they start the series off and they have, you know, no desire or plans to, you know, do a season two. So where they're just making the anime just as a promotional item for the uh, light novels. And that was something you saw a lot of, um, you know, three, four year, five years back. It still it still goes on now. It's it's a trend every season. Yeah, I, I like honestly, I think that's been sort of the increasing trend in the past, at least five six years. Well, at least a bit that more you're than that. that. Well, I know, but I mean, if you go back, well, basically, I would say probably since about two thousand four, two thousand five, maybe yeah, around two thousand six, but... where 
where light novels be, are becoming a big commodity and a known commodity if, to publishers, that's where you start seeing the change. Because, I mean, Slayers, uh, Full Metal Panic, all that kind of stuff that was done early 2000s, they, even if they didn't adapt the whole series, it still felt satisfying. Like, they still ended the anime in a way that you were like, well, I don't have to run out and read the books now to find out what happens next. Yeah, yeah so they were they uh especially in the early days they really tried to make it um you know just a whole series franchise where in the um uh I'd say the early 2010s you're just seeing one and done animes and then moving on to the next project. Early on yeah. you got the slayers who adapted materials from the light novels and then had their own entire original series or seasons yeah. um same with full metal panic and fumafu and then well just a even bunch of others. even well even boogie pop i mean boogie pop phantom the anime wasn't even adapted from any of the material if i recall it was kind of written it was kind of like its own story written after the events of the first book like it incorporated events of the first book but they were flashbacks if i recall like like, it was kind of weird how the anime was done for Boogie Pop. Like, it wasn't really a faithful adaptation of any of the material. The anime was kind of its own thing. And, and yeah, like, we see that happen a lot, that, you know, a lot of these anime, I mean, really, the only time an anime wouldn't feel like it had a, a full, complete ending was because it tanked in the first core. <laughs> yeah. Right? It got canned. Yeah, basically, exactly. But but now, like, well, of course, if you go back then, I mean, most anime got at least 24 episodes a season mm -hmm. yeah. as opposed to the half seasons we have now where they're only getting 12 or 13. So that could maybe also be part of the reason, too. Yeah, it seems like it seems like full adaptations are kind of like a distant memory. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Like, I remember being able to watch, start an anime and be like, oh, I can't wait how this concludes. And now it's pretty much just like, oh, well, that was kind of like a lame cliffhanger. Oh, I have to go read the books now, I guess. <laughs> well, at least now we're getting the books. Well, yeah, yeah true. Back, back, back in the early 2000s, if it was a light novel adaptation, you weren't getting anything. Well, yeah, that's true. And and I mean, we're let's face it, there's still lots of series that we don't have that were like that, that just ended, right? And didn't finish anything. So, but, I mean, you're right. At least it's getting better now. I mean, you know, Don Machi, The Devil is a Part-Timer. Like, there's a lot of series that are like that, that now at least we can read the book and see what happens next. And I kind of feel with Don Machi that as much as I'm... Like, I find that when I read the books, I'm really invested in the characters. But when I watched the anime, it felt more like the anime was more interested in the action sequences. Yeah, that's true. Like, that was that was kind of my feeling on it. Well, the problem is that in anime, you can't really get as invested with the characters as you can in the books because you're missing pretty much all of that monologue. Mm -hmm. That, like, is yeah, because like, don't forget that in the um, Don Machi main series, that Bell's point of view is told from the first person, so yeah, you know everything he's uh, thinking. And yeah, exactly. anime, it's none of that inner monologue. No, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Don Machi is one of those series where, and, and again, I think this is probably because Omori is a good writer, but um, it's one of the few series where. The main character is first person written from first person point of view. And then everything else is third person point of view. And I find that it works like it doesn't bug me, you know, um, sword art online does that in the main series and it bugs me. I'm just like, please, can we just tell this third person? I don't want to know what's going on in Kirito's head. <laughs> <laughs> but he has such, in he's such an interesting protagonist. Well, I, th like I think too, it's because in, in Don Machi, it feels balanced. You know what I mean? Like, like it isn't like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to tell two thirds of the book, third person and, oh, I feel like writing first person for a little while. So here we go. It, it, 
it seems to feel more balanced in terms of what's done first person and what's done third person. And I think too, it's probably because the story is so much about Bell's journey that having it be Bell's journey and told in his, you know, have a chunk of it told in his point of view makes sense and feels right. Because it, it really is a lot about particularly, you know, like I said, when he's fighting the Minotaur, I mean, if I, as much as it's visually cool to watch that whole inner monologue of his during that fight is really important and vital to knowing what he's thinking and what he's feeling and why he's pushing himself the way he is. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's especially important because you got, uh, you know, the safety net literally just right behind him. It's like any one of those people from Freya or from Loki Familia could take out that Minotaur in a single hit. Yep. Yeah, yep. so it's important to make sure that it's um, personal for Bell and not just some random mob that popped up that you want to beat. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, like I said, he and, and he does that throughout the series. And I, I think that's, and maybe that's kind of the best way to put it, is that when we need it to be in Bell's voice, it is. It doesn't feel superfluous or that he's just doing it for giggles. It's like, no, this is really important that we are hearing this in Bell's voice at this moment right now. Yeah, definitely. So, um, do you guys have anything else you'd like to say about the series or any topics we have not covered yet? Well, I kind of think it'd be important to bring up uh, at least just briefly the uh side series the sword oratoria the one that follows uh loki familia because i think it's really important that you got to realize that these two are it's not just a spin off that they're really um sister stories because in the main series you get bell's story and bell's growth whereas the other side story um, it focuses on Loki Familia, but it's that's where all the um, big, heavier elements over of the overall plot come in. Because you spoke before, uh, Justice, that it there's no, or it doesn't feel like there's this um, mustache twirling antagonist that you find early on. But if you go into the other uh, series that's where you start to see you know the main villains of which will be the ultimate conflict eventually in the main series as well but that's where you see that being set up hmm. so i mean really like you can read the main series without reading sword oratorio but there's certainly you're gonna benefit from reading it is that kind of <laughs> You'll definitely benefit from uh, reading both, yeah, because there's a lot of things. Because you'll get a point of views of the people that Bell interacts with, but you won't see that point of view in the main series. So, you know, if you're kind of curious as to why Eines just suddenly decides to uh, train Bell in the third volume, uh, well, you'll see why and you'll have a definitive answer if you go into the side series yeah. and so there's yeah there's a lot of that um kind of uh trading off where you'll see things in one series that'll make that'll further expand on things in the main one right yeah because i yeah you're right i've read the first two and uh it was volume number two of sword oratoria that really sort of cemented that whole reason of why eyes wanted to become and why she became interested in bell. Cause if I recall volume two of that ends with them seeing his fight against the Minotaur in volume three of the main series. I'm just trying From to From what I remember was, was volume one of sword oratoria. I think you said it was pretty much just like recap a lot of it. Or something? Uh, the first volume of Sword Oratoria basically takes place, like it ends where book one of the main series ends. So it's kind of like running parallel to volume number one of the main series. 
Yeah, they're almost uh one to one in terms almost. of yeah, almost where they end up. So that's just kind of where I keep it in my head. Yeah, yeah. There's sword oratoria is usually either one to one or it's only like a volume behind kind of thing. Like they're they're very close in terms of parallels in terms of where the main series where events are happening in the main series compared to where events are happening in sword oratoria they definitely make um Heinz's character a lot more interesting i will say that because what's interesting is in the don machi series the main series like Heinz is she really is like just an ideal in terms of her strength and ability but you don't really know much about who she is as a character What's funny is that uh, on the wiki for Don Machi, it says that uh, like I haven't watched the show in a while, but it, it says she o- she like only has like 150 speaking lines in the entire show. Yeah, that'd be about um, right. Well, and then whenever I remember the books, I'm like, was she really that silent? Well, always? she's yes. a pretty quiet yes, character. She is in the main series. I haven't series. read that series yet, but uh, in general, in the the original series like she's a quiet character yeah and just to um go over the sword oratoria um anime real quick they did something really weird in that they took the focus off of um uh eins and put it on uh put gave a lot more focus to the elf uh lafia oh yeah yeah and which is why I dropped the show. Yeah, it was it was really kind of weird because she's not very interesting, not very likable, and they decide to give her prime billing. I couldn't str- figure that out. Are, wait, are you and what's strange? Are you saying that the novel series is all, pretty much all Ein? Um, it majorly focuses on Ein's. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean. Okay, I, so now I might actually read the side story. Like the first, I mean, again, I've only read the first two volumes. The first two volumes were really good, were decent. They were good. And yeah, they're very, very focused on Ainz. In fact, the second one, uh, Lafia or whatever, is hardly in it at all. Like she's very little in it. So yeah, it's kind of strange. Like, and I didn't watch the anime because, you know, me and my whole, I won't watch an anime unless (laughs) I've read the light novels to catch up with it um my policy regardless but uh so i didn't watch the anime but i remember hearing that that a lot of people were kind of upset that it focused on her and not eyes when so much of that story is you know in the books is about eyes and about her story and Mm -hmm. who she is and why she is the way she is and everything else um well well, because the whole the whole point of the side series is learning more about her because you don't learn about her that much in the main series but then the anime kind of just like screw it like forget like learning more about her we're just gonna have this uh this really annoying high-pitched elf girl who's like totally has a lesbo crush on her constantly like fangirling over her the whole entire time and it was not that enjoyable (laughs) Well, they don't, and again, like they don't, that, that, that kind of a relationship is not, at least in the first, well, again, I'm only reading the first two books, but I mean, there's definitely, again, it's more in the book. I got the feeling it was much more the same way that Belle views Ainz is that whole idolization thing. It's not so much like a romantic feeling or whatever, that it's much more of a, you know, she's an idol. She's a something to aspire to that's that was more how it was presented i think in the side books at least in the first two volumes so so yeah so sword oratoria is a spin-off series of don machi but uh as kyle points out it is not like a completely disposable side story that has nothing to do with the main series it runs parallel and in a lot of cases you see points of view of characters that were involved in those incidents that you didn't see in the main series um actually now that you say that kyle i really need to read that series because i just finished volume 11 of don machi and man i really want to see that those events from Ainz's point of view oh it'll be great whenever that side series actually gets there because it's pretty uh, far behind oh is it i thought you'll, we you'll were probably 
I thought we were there now. I thought the most recent one was Well, uh, I'm I'm talking uh timeline wise cuz the latest oh. um the latest Sword Oratoria volume takes place I believe right before um the war game. Oh, re- oh really? Wow, okay. So that is very far behind timeline wise. Okay. Well, you you will be able to catch up on Oratoria pretty fast probably because from what I've seen on the the main series, like we're already getting volume twelve soon, which is only one volume away from catching up to the Japanese releases. And yeah. I don't know if the author, who who do you know is uh, it seems like he's taking it a lot slower with releasing the series because I think the the time between volumes twelve and thirteen was like nine months. So like it seems like once like once we catch up to volume thirteen, which we might do before the end of the year. You'll have plenty of time to just catch up on the mate on the side series. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, that's uh no, you're absolutely right, actually. Uh let me just uh I'm gonna look. Well, actually, you know what? You're well no, I'm I'm just taking a look. You're right. Like um it... Yeah, volume twelve came out in like May of twenty twenty seventeen and then thirteen didn't come out until February of this yeah. year. Yeah, there seems to be at least six to nine months or so between uh, releases as you get into the later as you get into the later series, uh, like later on into the series, like Volume Ten came out in May, and then Volume Eleven didn't come out until October, so that's like five months. It might also then... be. It might also be because each volume is longer. Well, yeah. Maybe, but... Well, then Volume Eleven to Twelve, it was October to May, and then you're right, May to February. So yeah, I mean. It certainly seems like there's a increasing amount of time between, but at the same time, though, I mean, he's also writing the side story and everything else, right? So, I mean, I guess it makes sense why it's taking a little bit longer to put out stuff. So we'll see. But, um, so yeah, so Don Machi, it's an excellent series. Ignore the title. Uh, go read it. <laughs> Get caught up because. Man, it just keeps getting better and oh, better. Man. One of the few series like one of the few series I can truly say that I've read eleven volumes of and every single volume has been just as good, if not better, than the one that came before it. And also, um like uh for those who want to uh read the other uh side story, like the Familia Chronicle. Oh, the Liu one? Or Ryu or yeah, it takes place exactly after the volume six. Oh, okay. So, okay, so, yeah, so there's two. <laughs> so there's Sword Oratoria, which you can basically read concurrently with the main series, because like we said, it, you know, like Kyle was saying, it basically is either one-to-one or it eventually starts lagging behind the main series. And But if you're going to read the one-off, which is Familia Chronicle, it is okay so you said it's after volume six that it's set yeah okay i haven't read that one yet and like it it, it's good but at the same time like it's not something well it's a side story so it's not something that will change anything in the main uh, main chronology right but it stars an awesome character so yes (laughs) yeah that's why i i read it like as soon as it came out yeah but the, there was only one thing that kind of annoyed me. I won't go too much into it because, uh, like, uh, it's a little bit sporterish. But uh, there was one thing that uh, kind of didn't really make sense in, well, in a way that, um, like, it, it kinds of doesn't take into account everything that uh, the other. Uh, like build up in the the main series like um the there are like two antagonists to Liu that are it, it's like they he decided to give them a level 4 status because it needed to have um Liu ne- needed to have a like a a good challenge mm. but uh like the when you uh, read into their backgrounds, it's like, well, they they are kind of on par with Bell. Like they they kind of increase their level. Like it, it's kind of 
like Dean Chrissy is not um, like uh, it, it doesn't follow what it's supposed to follow. It's not natural, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. It just kind of happens. Hmm. Yeah, it's not cohesive to uh, everything that uh, you has written uh, so far. Hmm. But other than that, if you can just leave that like uh, information behind, and uh, it, it's a great book. Hmm. All right. So uh, there you go. Um, anybody else want to add anything? I have one last question. Sure. Is it wrong to try to pick up girl in a dungeon? No. It no, it's not. <laughs> okay, next one. <laughs> <laughs> as long as she's as long as she's a nice girl who isn't going to kick your ass, sure, go ahead. All right. <laughs> go ahead, Kyle. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I was going to say one last last uh, thing to add is that there's a mobile game oh, out that's true. actually for uh, Don Machi. Right, yeah. Uh, called Memoria Freeze on mobile. And, you know, it's actually pretty fun. Um, it's very uh, free-to-pay friendly. Free-to-play friendly. And, um, yeah, it follows the story uh, that's been told in uh, the animes and the novels really closely, and it even has a few hmm, really? original episodes. And it's put out by Crunchyroll too, right? Yes, it's been put out oh. and censored by Crunchyroll. <laughs> yeah, you don't get to touch the waifus. I want my money back. Okay, okay, no. <laughs> okay, that's why I'm so not stop, putting any stop, money into stop. it. What? <laughs> Basically, basically, no, what this... happened is like in the original version, it, it's it's pretty much almost like a visual novel. But in the original version, you have like a touchpad or whatever, and like it, you can like poke the characters, and they'd have like dialogue that they'd speak or whatever. But they pretty much censored it from the U.S. release. And then when people mm -hmm. on on like online started going into forums asking what was what why it was being censored. Crunchyroll basically lied to their faces saying that it wasn't actually censored when it really was. Oh. And then people got pissed off. Yeah, they went into the whole defin uh the whole Bill Clinton, what is the definition oh, of is is pretty much yeah. Yeah, I was like, really kind of like, messed like, up. It was something it was over something so stupid, like fan service, but I think people got more pissed off with them denying that it was censorship than it was clearly <laughs> censorship. Okay, so so like, 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 who do you think's gonna buy? Who do you think's gonna play this game? Like, they, they want, want to game. touch the waifus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know you are. You know you know your audience. <laughs> well, Come on. I I don't know that they do because they're still censoring boobies. <laughs> I mean, I keep yeah. looking at there's like that new service High Dive or whatever, and they. You actually can choose to watch things uncensored on there. They actually have a feature where you can go in and watch uncensored versions of things. And I'm kind of like, you know, Crunchyroll, I don't understand why, if that stuff's available, why Crunchyroll doesn't... I mean, even if they password it so, you know, adults can unlock it themselves, why they don't offer that? Well, maybe I, it's just I a funny policy. <laughs> don't know. Oh, no, I'm, sh I'm sure it is, but, you know still <laughs> what, what was that i don't believe in piracy except i did it for the boobies <laughs> no 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 i'm a very good boy <laughs> i did it for the uncensored well, boobies um okay i definitely i definitely i definitely I definitely watched High School DxD censored on Crunchyroll. I definitely didn't want to see any of them boobs. Nope. <laughs> Not at all. Nope. Um, in Not any case, here. so, okay, so there's a mobile game. And is the mobile game, Kyle, like it covers the whole thing? Like like up to like volumes, whatever, like 11 and stuff? or It covers everything the anime covers. And then they just added... Um the episode Liu chapters. Oh. And um they had a orig an original story uh the grand celebration that was written by the author hmm. where it 
it actually goes into the backgrounds of um, one of the three great beasts that you uh, hear about really vaguely as a backstory. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So it goes into the uh, behemoth. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and just to, um, yeah, just to add on to uh, our viewers, there was in the uh, Don Machi lore, there was three great beasts that all the fami- uh, familias banded up together to defeat. There was a uh, Leviathan of the oceans, behemoth of the land, and then uh, I think it's called the Red Eyes Dragon of the Sky. Red Eyes Black Dragon. Then, oh, God, I was yeah. about to say that. <laughs> I I think that's his literal name. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, but he's the one uh the dragon was the one who uh survived and ended up wiping out um Hera and Zeus familias. Right. So just a bit of a lore dump. Lore dump. Yeah. I I do like that they're starting to explore more like the uh lore and older and stuff like that. I I want them to do more of that. Um, I'll be curious to see if we get into that now that we've moved, finished a story arc in volume 11. So I'll be very curious to see where volume 12 goes. All right. So there you go. If you want to get your mad Don Machi fix, you can read the main series. You can read the Sword Oratorio spinoff. You can read, oh, the manga is also licensed by Yen Press. Uh, You can also read... There's just the one volume of Familia Chronicle, and you can play a video game. Like, you can get all the Don Machi you want, and you should get lots of it because it is, if you can't tell from what we've been saying, a very good series. <laughs> uh, and, and Kyle, I know you said that was your last thing, but Jean Luc or Flies, do you guys have anything you want to add or <laughs> that we haven't copied or covered? No, I'm pretty much. That's everything. Yeah, there's not much else to go on. No, we're good? All right. All right, so that is where we are going to end our Don Machi Volumes 1 to 3 episode for tonight. Uh, Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. And to all of our listeners, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, We had all these grand schemes about what we were going to do for the next episode, and then kind of realized as we started recording that we never actually decided <laughs> what we were going to do. So um, it'll be a surprise. Watch, I, I don't know, self-plug. Watch my YouTube videos. I usually say at some point what we're going to do when I do the weekly countdown of the top 10. I usually spoil it there, whatever the next one's going to be. So, <laughs> so until then. <laughs> so once again, thank you everybody for joining us. And... Uh, Well, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks with whatever it is we've decided to talk about at that time. Until then, thanks very much. Bye-bye for now. For show notes and related links, visit lightnovelpodcast.com.